Welcome for another uh, edition of Wednesday Night Bible Study. We're working through the Gospel of John and we'll pick up and finish up with chapter 15 uh, this evening. But before I do, let me just give you a couple of uh, uh, updates on kind of what's happening and some things to look forward to. Johnny uh, is back with us. He started back in the office on Monday uh, feeling good. He will be uh, with us on Sunday leading worship in the first service. And so we just want to, uh, to say a special word of thanks to God for his, his healing and his care for both Johnny and Kim and the protection for their family as well through this, this time. Uh, it's been wonderful to have him back in the office this week. Also, this Sunday, we will celebrate baptism in the second service. So if you're normally here for that second service, just know that we'll be celebrating baptism. If you want to join us online, uh, it's always a special time to be able to celebrate with an individual and their family. Uh, this particular individual is a student in our youth ministry. And so to celebrate with him and, and the family in this decision that he has made to make Jesus his Lord and Savior and following through uh, out of obedience uh, in baptism. And so it's a wonderful time in the life of the church to be able to celebrate that. So I wanted you to be aware of that. Don't forget, we do still have tickets available for the date night uh, with Bob Smiley. Um, if you haven't had a chance to hear him before, I would encourage you to look for him on YouTube. He is uh, a gifted comedian, Christian comedian, and uh, I've had the opportunity to work with him before to, to be at uh, a couple, three different shows that he's done. And so it's, a, it's always a good time. And so see Chris this weekend, or actually you can purchase tickets online, uh, but uh, make sure to do that. It comes with a meal and this time with Bob. And so it'll be a, a wonderful time to celebrate as a family. Um, all right, let's move into chapter 15 of the Gospel of John. Last week we covered the first part of this chapter, and it's such an important part because Jesus uses a wonderful picture, a beautiful analogy of, of a branch and uh, a vine. Jesus being the vine, and we are the branches that are to stay connected to him. And we know that if you take a branch away from a tree or from a vine, uh, it's eventually going to wither and die. Uh, but as long as that branch is connected, to the vine, to uh, it receives the nutrients, it receives uh, what it needs to survive and to thrive, to bear fruit. And Jesus said, if you remain in me, if you abide in me, this intimate relationship, if you remain in me, um, your joy will be complete and you will bear fruit. And he says, to remain in me, what you have to do is keep my commands, do what I've taught you. And then he, we closed last week with that foundational command. He said, my command is this, to love one another. And so Jesus is explaining to his disciples and to us how important it is for us as his followers, as his disciples, to remain in him, to spend time with him, to have that intimate relationship. And we do that by following his teachings, doing what he says, and, and foundationally at the heart of that is loving God, which we were dealing with on Sunday morning, and this particularly this coming Sunday morning of, of loving God with all that we have. And Jesus taking that, that Shema and, and saying that's the greatest command, to love God with all that you have, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so here in uh, John chapter 15, he says the foundational command, my command is that you love one another. Now, when we do that, when we are his disciples, we'll move into what comes next in this chapter. We need to know uh, Jesus came in chapter 10. He tells us he came to give us life and not only life, but life to the full. And then he says, if we remain in him, we will, uh, his love will remain in us and uh, our joy will be made complete. But when we do that, the world will not see us, will not love us, will not uh, really acknowledge and accept us because we have chosen to follow a different path. We have chosen to realize that, that we're, not, uh, we're not meant for this world. We're just passing through. We're pilgrims. And so Jesus tells his disciples and us uh, that we need to be prepared for that. Beginning in verse 18, he says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. 
If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I have spoken to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Now there's a lot there to unpack, but really some uh, core teachings that we need to understand. As I said, as we began, Jesus is reminding his disciples and us that as followers of, of him, that we no longer belong to this world. He has chosen us out of this world. And so if the world hates us, it's because it hated him first. And the word there really means this idea that certainly hates me because it has actually continually hated uh, it's this idea of, con of continuity, and this is not going to change, in other words. There's not going to be a point where the world all of a sudden decides to accept us and love us. Uh, now, our calling, according to what uh, he ends this chapter with, is that we are to testify about him, to share the truth with those around us in hopes that they will too accept this truth and allow Jesus to choose them out of this world as well. But we need to realize and go into it with open eyes that the world is not going to accept us. He says, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you don't belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of it. That is why the world hates you. Now, in looking at a couple of different commentaries in preparation for our time together this evening, one of the commentaries that I, I typically look at, A.T. Robertson, is just a phenomenal study on the Gospel of John particularly. But he makes a point that really made, made me stop and think. Uh, he uses these few verses here as a litmus test to not only see it as Jesus warning us and preparing us for what is to happen, but really looking at it from the other side to say, does the world hate us? Does the world accept us? And if so, should it? Based on what Jesus has told us, the world is always going to be the place uh, of under the rule of Satan. That this world is always going to bring that corruption, that evil. And while God intended the world to be a place of, of uh, joy and happiness for us, and, and as we talked about this past Sunday, God intends for our life here uh, to be one of joy, but it only happens when we follow Him and we obey Him. And so in the midst of that, uh, A.T. Robertson turns it around and he says, does the world accept us? If so, we must not be doing what we should be doing. We must not be living as we should be living or the world wouldn't accept us. The world would reject us. Now I can tell you, given our world in which we live today, it is not hard to see the friction and the divide between the world and true believers. Uh, our world has continued to, to remain corrupt and evil and self-centered because it's a place of sin. Sin has taken over. But God has called us out of that to be different. And when we are different, uh, the world is not going to accept us. So A.T. Robertson asked the question, has the world become more Christian or Christians more worldly? And so we need to let that resonate with us. Uh, in fact, if that's all we really get out of this passage tonight, that's an important thing for us to wrestle with. 
has the world become more Christian or has our Christians become more worldly? My fear is oftentimes it's easier for a Christian to become more worldly than the world to become more Christian. Now we're called into this battle. We're, we're called into this, uh, this ministry to be different, to uh, not be worldly, and to serve as an example of love and obedience to God. Because Jesus reminds us that when he is lifted up, he will draw people to himself. The world needs to see that difference in us, but we need to realize, and that's what Jesus is teaching us, is that means that they're not going to accept us. They are going to hate us in his words. He says, remember I told you a servant is not greater than his master. Uh, we learned that uh, earlier in this same gospel. And so what he's saying there is, the world hates me, they're going to hate you. You're not greater than I am. They're not going to hate me but love you. If you're truly following me, they're going to hate you as well. He says, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. The word there really carries the idea of, of a wild beast, beast in pursuit of its game. Uh, that's, that's the picture. Um, we're told throughout uh, in, in other parts of Scripture that, that Satan roams around like a lion, um, ready to devour, ready to pounce. Uh, looking for that opportunity. That, that's the picture here. He said that the world, if they persecute me, they will persecute you. They will go after you as a, a wild animal goes after its prey. Um, if they obeyed my teachings, he says, they'll obey your teachings also. But he's pointing out that the world doesn't normally do that. They will treat you this way because my, of my name, uh, because of my character, because of who I am. Um, for they don't know who sent me. Jesus has gone back and forth with the Jewish religious leaders up to, to this point in the gospel about how if they really knew the Father, they would know Jesus because Jesus comes from the Father and Jesus and the Father are one. And so he's using that same idea here. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they don't know the one who sent me. This is kind of a slap uh, even now against the, uh, the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. And he restates this again uh, a couple of lines later. He says, if I had not done among them the works, the miracles, no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my Father. I've wrestled with that concept, the idea that, well, if Jesus hadn't come, then would sin be an issue? I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus comes. He has told us throughout this gospel that he is the, the way, the truth, the life, that he is the light, uh, that he is the gate, uh, that he is the living water. And so when we think of him in that way, his coming comes to bring truth. Uh, Jesus even said earlier in this gospel, I don't come to condemn, but your, your words condemn you. Your actions condemn you. The issue here is not that Jesus came just so that he could uh, place the burden of sin on humanity. We did that ourselves. We uh, sin out of our own uh, volition, our own desires. What he's saying here is, I have come to bring the truth, to be the light. And what does light do? It sheds light on, it exposes. And so by Jesus coming, what he is saying, I believe, is that his very presence, his coming, his teaching has shed light on, has exposed the sin that's already there. Um, then he goes on to say, I, I've, I've done these signs, I've done these works, these miracles, and you have seen them. These people have seen me do these things, but yet they still choose to hate me and, and hate God. Now, you may remember... Uh, we worked through that when he was teaching that earlier in the gospel. And we talked about the fact that um, it is so important for us not to get so bent on what we think is true. We need to always be open to the fact that this is the only truth. And we come to this with an open heart and an open mind. Um, it's easy for us to grasp hold of something and say this is true and nothing else can be true. 
And I believe that's really what the religious leaders of Jesus' day had done. They, they had the law and they, they held on to that law. That was what they knew to be true. And anybody that challenged their perception of that law was to be rejected. Uh, may that not be true of us. We need to come to this word with open hearts and open minds and hold what we perceive to be truth with very loose hands, always testing it against what we find here in Scripture. And so I encourage you to do that. I think that's what he's talking about here. These folks had, had so grasped hold of what they believed to be true that they rejected anything that didn't fit into their narrow idea of what truth is. So often we can do the same. And then he says, this all happened to fulfill what was written in their law. They hated me without reason. That actually is a, uh, a quote from Psalm 69, verse 4. Um, one of the theologians I've looked at says, this is part of the mysterious purpose of God. Jesus came knowing that people would reject him, knowing that, that what he taught may or may not be accepted by all, would not be accepted by all. Then he moves back into this idea that he was talking about earlier in this passage, and that is the, the, the coming of the, the comforter, the paraclete. He says, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father will testify about me. The work of the Holy Spirit, as we found out earlier in our study in, in chapter 14, verse 26, is that he not only uh, teaches truth, reveals truth, but he also brings to mind that truth that we have learned, the teachings that Jesus has given us that we have already learned. He brings those back to mind when, when necessary. So the Spirit's work is to testify to this truth and to, to remind us of this truth. But then he says, and you also must testify for you have been with me from the beginning. Not only is the Holy Spirit here to testify about Jesus, who Jesus is, about the truth, but we're to do the same as his followers. If we abide in him, to tie this passage, this, this chapter together, if we abide in him and he abides in us, he says we will bear much fruit, and that is to the glory of God. And we do that by being obedient to what he teaches us, to keeping his commands, abiding in his commands. And the greatest foundational command is to love. When we do that, the world is going to reject us. But that is how we testify. That is how we do what he's taught us to do, told us that we're commanded to do. That we are not only to rely on the Holy Spirit to testify, we're to do it ourselves. And how we testify is just sharing how Jesus has made a difference in our lives, why we have the love that we have, why we don't fit in this world anymore, because we've chosen a different way. Jesus is the way, and we've chosen Him. So may we be found faithful in the way that we live. May we not be worldly Christians, but rather Christians who stand out in the world to point people to Him. That's what He's called us to do. May we, be, may we be about that. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this teaching. Jesus, thank you for what you have done to come and to give us your truth and your word. We thank you for choosing us out of this world. We ask that you would use us to be examples of love, examples of sacrificial compassion for those around us. May the world see that as different. It will see it as different. May they see you in that, not us, not, not so that someone will look at us and think that we're a good person, but rather that they would see you so that we can fulfill what you have commanded, that we testify on your behalf, that we tell others through the way that we live and through our words the difference that you have made in our lives. May others be drawn to you because of us. Jesus, it's in your name we pray it. Amen. Thanks for being with us.